Hey, welcome back. Today we're going over the Airsoft Double Bell Mark 12 Mod 1. Now, I'm going to an Airsoft event in a couple weeks where I need a DMR rifle for. And after looking over the rule sets for AMS, Milsim West, Third Coast Airsoft, and the field I'm headed to, it seems like the Mark 18 is pretty much universally recognized as a DMR, so I decided to get one. Now, let's get the unboxing out of the way. I still hate unboxing videos. Before I start putting parts in this and upgrading it, I just wanted to show it to y'all. Now, the Mark 18 is kind of an interesting beast. Um, it was originally like the brainchild of the president of Armalite who wanted to build a longer range, more accurate version of the M4 without being as bulky as the M16, kind of taking some inspiration from the SEAL Recce rifles. And it was very much a gun based on what was available at the time being done on a shoestring budget. Originally it was going to be an upper receiver only. The guy building them found out there were some M16A1s that, like from the 70s that were being thrown out, so he managed to get those lower receivers to make them complete rifles, and he just kind of picked through the receivers and picked the good ones to build his SPR, the Special Purpose Rifle, instead of the Special Purpose Receiver. And these got used a lot initially by SOCOM in the military, and then later on the Marines actually adopted them, simply because due to the suppliers that made the Mark 12 Mod 1 at the time, they could get those rifles easier than they could get more of their squad advanced marksman rifle that they were fielding at the time. So initially this, the, the initial guns had a PRI front end with a special arm sleeve on the top. This is intended to be the Mark I version which used a nice armament company rail here and got rid of the sleeve. The military guns interestingly did not have this blip up front sight Double Bell decided to create this. You push the button and poop it up. And they added that. That was on the SPR Mod 0. It's not on the SPR Mod 1. And this is supposed to be a Mod 1 replica. So they kind of missed that when they made this copy. Also, the um, Mod 1 should have had a nice armament clip up front sight here on the rail. This obviously doesn't. And would have had a nice armament rear sight. And this copy has, it looks like it's a copy of an arms rear sight. This is a very badly built one. This is zinc pot metal that was just painted over the top. And I can actually see, I'm just going to get this on camera, um, up here at the front, there's actually bare metal exposed. Also, the pistol grip here, they have some sort of match pistol grip they added to this. The real SPRs originally, since they were built on the best M16A1 lower receivers that they could find. We had M16A1 pistol grips and M16A1 stocks. Some of them had A2 stocks. Uh, some people replaced the pistol grip within SOCOM and spray painted them. So that caused some ergo grips to become in use. I haven't managed to find any photo evidence of an actual SPR being used without either an A1, an A2, or a ergo grip on it. So this fancy grip that Double Bell put on, I cannot find any evidence of the actual rifle having been shipped with these. In addition, Double Bell added a sling loop there that you could hook to. As far as I know, none of the original, like I can't find any photo evidence of that particular sling set. I found pictures of these tied together in all sorts of different ways, paracord around. Um, somebody did a figure eight with paracord around there plus around the back of the trigger and clipped his sling to that. All sorts of weird ways to people added slings to these, but I've never seen a loop like that. gg and g actually does make a loop like that, so if you're looking for a real gun that has that, you can get them that will work on a real rifle. Overall, the externals on this are so-so, ignoring the fact where the, this varies from the real guns. I had a little bit of rust on the roll pin for the trigger guard, and that's just a roll pin there, wiggles a little. The stock, it doesn't look too bad for an A2 stock. It does have the A2 style textured butt plate, 
and you can flip that down that's where the battery goes it's not bad but at the same time if you compare it to the real thing it's very cheap and hollow feeling you have a screw holding the mag release in that's actually pretty common for airsoft guns there are no markings on the receiver and then we have the generic warning don't shoot your eye out sticker on it that the disassembly here the takedown are just allen head screws they, so they're not pins that are retained like you'll see on a real gun or with the nicer vfc clones it comes with two of these handguard covers unfortunately it doesn't come with a third so when you grab it you basically are on cheese grater at the bottom doesn't really bother me since i'm not planning to use them i'm going to replace them with ladder covers anyways but just something to be aware of if you're planning to use that you'll probably want either to get more covers like this for the bottom or add a foregrip most of the pictures i've seen of the real guns in use have a nice arm room handle foregrip and a Harris bipod of some type. I haven't found any pictures that are the gun in use without a silencer. One of the problems with finding out what the real guns look like versus the civilian copies is there's not a whole lot of these the actual military guns that were made. I heard one person say the SPR Mod Zero initially had a run of 132 silencers. The Opsync silencer and all this was actually designed by a guy in his garage who did some really innovative things at the time, you know, late 90s, for digitizing sound waves or recording sound waves in a like visual format um, at the exact moment a gun shot, so we could build the silencers around that. But at the same time, that ancient technology is great in the early 2000s when these guns were being built. But it was literally a guy in his garage. Um, if you want to do anything as tempting to be clone correct, it's worth noting that the OPSYNC silencers that were attached to this are incredibly long. Um, they're a little over 230 millimeters. So if you want like the same look, same length of the actual military guns, let me keep in mind most airsoft silencers are significantly shorter than that. Um, at the moment, there's two on a beak that are the right length. So, oh, I wanted to mention also with these hand guards, what's supposed to happen is you push in on the little metal piece there and then slide them off. On the other hand, I push in on the little metal piece and this thing does not want to move at all. I'm going to rip that out and then take the whole thing off. Also, from the factory, the hand guard was a little loose. If that happens to be, like you order one of these and it's loose, tighten this ring here and I've got that hand tight and then some and nothing up front wiggles. Body is metal, no idea what kind of metal. Externals remind me a lot of the GNG combat machine to be honest. Safety's a little clicky. Trigger is surprisingly heavy for an airsoft gun but it's also mushy just like a normal AEG trigger. There's no reset or anything like that. It's just push. And we've got a safe semi-auto fire control group. Okay, now I'm going to go work on upgrading this thing. So I was originally planning to put a suppressor on that, but after throwing the gun in the case, I realized that the 42-inch case was not going to fit a Mark 12 with a suppressor on it that came out to be about 44 or 45 inches long. So, I'm going ahead and going to get use the uh, stock muzzle brake. Now, yesterday off camera, I took the orange tip off. Basically, take out the set screw. My phone will focus, it won't. Anyways, you take out the set screw and then you can just pry this thing off. You end up with the orange tip and it's a little dinged up, but it's okay. One thing that kind of annoys me here, if we look closely, the muzzle brake. Okay, now my phone's going to focus. One thing that annoys me is you've got that little hole from the set screw going in, and that's a threaded hole. And you also have this extension on the end of the muzzle brake that shouldn't actually be there. 
So I'm going to take a Dremel to cut most of that off and finish it off with a file to make it even. And yeah, it's going to leave a little bit of exposed uh, metal on the end, but I'm going to paint the entire thing anyway, so I don't care. So it's kind of boring to watch all these chrono tests in the build process, especially considering I had to rebuild this a few times. So let me just explain what happened. Initially, when I took out the gun, I shot it. All, all of these tests we were playing out are done with 0.28 gram BBs, just because that's going to be convenient for what's the event I'm going to. But everything I've been testing with is 2.8. Um, anyways, the stock gun, took it out, chronographed it. With the hop-up completely off, it was shooting an average of 282 feet per second with a min of 377 and a max of 386. So the standard deviation there is about 3 FPS, and that was with the, the hop-up off. I tried turning the hop-up on. Um, this hop-up that it had originally, if you look, it's got these little teeth around the edge, so you can kind of get a feel for how far on and off it is, because it only does one rotation around, and you can kind of see those markers. And I kept shooting it and updating the hop and checking the chronograph um, up to a little over 75%. And it did not make a difference on the trajectory that I could tell. Like, visibly, they, they weren't flying straight like they should. They weren't nose diving into the ground like they normally do if you have a lot of pop, but not quite enough. They weren't flipping up into the sky like they do with too much hop. Um, they're just kind of going out there. But I rechronographed it with the different hop settings, and at 50%, it dropped my average velocity down to 359. So I had a little over a 20, 25 foot FPS drop by turning on the hop up. So something was definitely happening there. Um, but when I turned the hop up up, the standard deviation on the velocity went up to about 5 FPS. I keep looking at this because there's all my numbers. I'll drop it in in a second on the spreadsheet. So I decided I'm going to replace, I was already planning to put an MR, MR hop bucking in, and I didn't really want to open a gearbox because that's a bunch of extra work I don't want to do. So I tried initially just putting an MR hop in the existing hop-up assembly, and I used an Omega nub, which all these are from Maple Leaf, so it works really well on my other gun. Um, and when I put that in, the FPS on the gun dropped through the floor. Um, with the new bucking and completely hop completely turned off, I was shooting an average of 301 FPS, and the BBs were basically nose diving, which is typical for when you're getting some backspin applied, but nowhere near enough. So on a whim, I kept turning up the hop up, like in about 25% increments, and at 75%, it was spinning the BBs too high, and they're going over the trees. So I backed it up a little bit, kind of fine-tuning, and at about 70%, it's shooting great. And I ran it over the chronograph at 70%, and that gave me 295 FPS. So I got about a 5% FPS drop by turning up the uh, hop up correctly with the MR hop bucking. And I played around with that a little bit and discovered it wasn't staying consistent. Like I'd take four or five shots and then have to adjust the hop up bucking again because it, it tended to um, increase the amount of hop over time. So it's like, tink, he's going way over the target high. So um, I did some asked around on Reddit and somebody said that the reason I saw the big FPS drop is that the MR hop is supposed to have an internal ring that's raised up inside the hop up that's supposed to fit in a barrel that's got a cutout like that. The camera will focus. Um, basically a ring that the extra rubber is supposed to fit in. On a whim, I just wrapped the entire thing with Teflon tape. It seems to me, I could tell the um, stock barrel did not have that ring. This is from an old BR-16 barrel. Um, the stock barrel did not have that nut. So I figured, okay, we'll try it. Just wrapping Teflon tape around the front. And really, if that was the issue, 
Um, you'd think not having the ring in the barrel would cause the hop-up to bulge where that extra material inside the hop-up rubber was and it wouldn't fit right in the hop-up assembly um, and it would seal better, not worse. But anyways, I tried just wrapping Teflon tape around the front to see if I, that would seal it. Now, that did sort of seal it. Um, what I found is with the MR hop, my FPS consistency came down to about 3.8. When I put Teflon tape around it, my FPS came up. So my average went 305, so slight increase. Um, but the FPS consistency, the, the standard deviation, went all, all the way up to 5.9. Uh, and to put that in perspective, like a tuned gun, you should have an FPS. St the standard deviation of your FPS should be under 2. Um, I've very, I've only once seen something make it under 1 FPS standard deviation, but usually you want it under 2. At least under 3. Um, so, the Teflon tape mod didn't seem to make any difference. I had a tiny bit of increase, but it wasn't consistent. So, this at this point, I finally broke down and opened the gearbox. I replaced the stock cylinder, which is this one. It's got a big hole in the back with a non-ported cylinder. I actually didn't realize there was a cut on the back for it to grab the teeth. I don't know if that was lined up or not on the new cylinder. Oops. Um, I'll check the next time I have the gearbox open. Probably won't be anytime soon. Pain in the butt. Anyways, um, I put a full cylinder in, so that covers that up should increase the amount of air going down the barrel. Because as the piston comes across here, until the piston has gone past that opening, some of the air is going out the opening and some is going down the barrel. Um, and just blocking that off should increase the volume of air going down the barrel. And it's a long barrel. Um, it should help. I also put an M130 spring in it. And that got my FPS, when I chronoed it after making those modifications, to be... Uh, Average of 393 with a range of 387 to 405. So it jumped to about two. The, the average there is about two joules, plus or minus a tenth. And my FPS consistency got even worse. It got up to a standard deviation of 6.4. Not good. So, oh, and it's shooting hot. My goal is to have a um, joules number of just under 1.88 to comply with field rules. It's the equivalent of 450 FPS with point twos. So, I decided I need to do something about the fact that the BB, the, the hop up isn't staying consistent. So, I have an old VFC hop up unit. That was from another project, I just didn't install it. And that thing's probably like six, seven years old. Um, and on a whim, I just took the MR hot bucking, the Omega nub, and the stock barrel from the new gun, and dropped it in that hop up chamber. That had some pretty surprising results. Doing that got my FPS average to 434. And that was a min of 432 to a max of 439, um, which is an average joules of 4 point, excuse me, 2.45. So that's over sniper rules um, almost anywhere. Um, that's the equivalent of a little over 500 FPS with a 0.2. So obviously that I couldn't take it to the field. But that dropped... The standard deviation came down to 2.6. So I pulled out the M130 spring and put the stock spring back in it. That's where it is now. That's how it's going to go to the BB Wars event I'm going to in a week at Airsoft GX, or two weeks when I'm recording this. So after I put the original spring back in, I'm using the VFC pop up assembly. The Maple Leaf MR Hop Bucking, 70 degree if you care, um, <clears throat> the Omega Nub. I discovered the um, 
bucking has actually ripped slightly, but it seems to be shooting fine. So next time I order parts, I'll order a new bucking to replace it. Um, no Teflon tape mod at this point. The stock spring, that combination of parts got me to shooting an average of 370.9 FPS with a min of three, uh, 369, max of 372.8. So I'm averaging 1.78 joules, literally a tenth of a joule below the limit. So that kind of gives me a little wiggle room if I go to the field and like atmospheric conditions change something. And that's got my standard deviation down to 1.3 FPS. And the range there from like min to max is 3.8 FPS. So really we're talking plus or minus two. I'm happy with that. Um, the range isn't going as far as I'd like. It's not able to, I, I think I hit my 188 foot target a couple times but it's not hitting that consistently, which part of it's the wind, part of it's the fact that I'm only using 0.28s. Next time I order parts, I'm gonna get some 0.4s and see how it likes those. Okay, let's talk about the externals next. First off, at the end, I've just got it in a Vic barrel bag. I highly recommend those, and yes, I'm used to play paintball. Um, I wish the airsoft industry would adopt barrel bags. I bought a big one, for use around a silencer. Then what I ended up discovering, two things. First off, the scrub screw that holds this front piece on, I can't get that off. I'm sure I could drill it out. I don't care that much. And the total length of this gun is about the longest that could fit in my case. So if I did take that front piece off and put an appropriate length silencer on this gun, um, that adds, as you can see, a couple inches of length and it would now no longer fit in my case. So we're just leaving that alone. Um, I got a cheap, uh, it's a knockoff of the KAC uh, carry handles. I own a real KAC carry handle. The knockoffs seem to be about the same. I did have to cut it a little bit because this rail is maybe a little wider than spec, but it fits there. Um, I've got a tiny little there's no way you're going to see this. Um, a sling loop there. I bought this on Amazon. I have no idea when. In like a four pack. Um, and I've just added a little bit of paracord there so I can clip my sling swivel too. Or my uh, HK clips for my sling. So I can just attach a sling to the front. And I've got ladder rail covers on the side. And that's just because I like the thinner grips. So I can grab that and. I can't do this there. Um, it's just not sticking out as much when I grab it. Put an A2 pistol grip on. This is a motor grip from ZCI. I picked that brand just because it's the cheapest one on a e-bike. It works fine, no complaints. The whole thing got painted um, Rothko camouflage tan with some green on top. It probably should have more green. And actually, that side does have more green. Yay, it looks better. Not a big deal. Um, it's going to get all scratched up and look Boba Fett-like very soon anyways. And I added a knockoff Harris 5 pod. This specific one is from a company called Quode, or Twood. Generic Chinese copy. Now, I will point out, when you get a bipod, if you've got one of these guns, you want to get a bipod that comes with a Picatinny rail adapter because normally these are designed to go on a sling swivel or a sling stud um, so you need the pick rail adapter to mount it on something with a Picatinny rail and I would also highly recommend getting one that tilts now I know that's going to sound a little weird but the thing is if you put your gun down and there happens to be like a rock over here pushing it up or you know, if the ground isn't level if you have one that tilts you can just rotate the gun back and forth and you'll be back to level um, that's important on real firearms so that your scope adjustments go up and down correctly not at a slight angle and for the airsoft ones your hop-up assembly is not going to behave nicely if the whole gun is slanted crooked so if you're going to put down the bipod on anything you want something that can tilt 
Um, and I go as far as getting one that's got one of these lever locks. This will allow me to control the tension on the lever. So like here, it rotates, tilts easily. If I flip the lever to the other side and up, it does not rotate at all. So that gives you the flexibility to just adjust as needed on your tension. And obviously you want to mount it so the legs go forward. And as you'll notice over here, when I painted it, I didn't actually have the legs all the way out on one side, so I have a little bit of black there. Once again, it's going to get an all boba fat looking anyway, so it doesn't really matter much. But in terms of externals, I'm happy with it. Um, oh, it's worth pointing out, this rear sight is hard to take off, which is why I left it there. I did have to move it forward because it's really tall and it was touching the bottom of my scope. And this is just an old Tasco scope I already had. With a riser, so you're... If you're putting a scope on an AR-15, you want to use a riser. Otherwise, your eyeball is going to have to be incredibly low. And if you're a normal human with, like, a skull and a jaw, that doesn't fit. And then you turn your head all funny and wonky to get your eyeball low enough to get a proper riser. Now, all that said, there will probably be a part two of this video, because when I get a little more money, I'm planning to replace the hop-up assembly instead of the VFC one that's in here now. I'll get, I haven't decided what, but it's one of the fancy ones. I'm planning to replace the inner barrel with something that's stainless steel that I can polish up, see if that improves the accuracy. I'm planning to get a Maple Leaf MR hop bucking, but a, a 75 degree instead of the 70 degree in here, that's in here now. See if that makes any difference. Um, and I'm planning to run this with some 0.4 gram BBs instead of the 0.28s that I have now. So that all has the potential to make a pretty significant performance difference. On the flip side, that's $110 worth of parts. So I'll get around to it when I get the extra money, but in the meantime, I gotta feed the chickens and you know, life goes on. When I get more airsoft money for toys like this, you'll get a part two of the video. My guess is that's going to be late June, so in a month. But that's it for now. This is how I'm planning to take this out to uh, Airsoft GI's BB Wars. And we'll keep doing.